night folks. Welcome to the Rafter K Rustics Kitchen. I'm your host and world-renowned celebrity chef Pierre Dryblatter. You know, today's going to be not exactly a kitchen, it's going to be a mix of kitchen and, and shop because the other day I was a little bit aggressive with some sweet potatoes and I broke the plastic handle off of this wonderful knife. It's not really a bad knife. I mean, you know, for 10 bucks I could probably get a new one. But I got to looking at it and I realized that for only probably $15 worth of materials and four or five hours of my time, I could build a new handle for this knife and have something that'll last me uh, probably till I break it. So that's what we're going to do today is I'm going to make a new handle for this fine blade. I uh, know it's not Damascus. It's not one of those big long through hand tang or through tang knives like you see on Forged in Fire. It's got this little bitty tiny tang. But I think what I can do is drill out a hole here where there used to be a pin. There's already a hole here. And then I can drill another hole. We're going to extend the handle somewhat forward and then take it back to where it belongs. And that should provide enough support. This might last me three, four weeks. The handle is made up of three scales. The outer ones are hickory because I built my kitchen cabinets out of hickory. And I have a lot of little pieces left over. It's also hard, easy to work with, and I like the way it looks. The spacer piece is red eucalyptus from my neighbor's tree. Now for the story. The other night, my wife and I were invited to dinner with a group of friends. Oddly, we rarely get invited to dinner, and even oddlier, we even more rarely get invited back. I have no idea why this is, but I've been watching Kelly to see if it's something she's doing or saying that's causing it. I'll figure it out. At any rate, one of the couples had just had a grandchild, and the women were started talking about labor and childbirth and such. And I, as politely as you please, mentioned in passing that, not including my own birth, I'd been through childbirth four times, and while it was unpleasant, it certainly wasn't bad enough to keep me from having other kids. Sure, it was rude when Kelly called me all those names, but I love her, and besides, I have a pretty thick skin, so my feelings were only hurt for a bit. The worst part was when the doctor told her to push and she dug her fingernails into my arm. Sure, it hurt, but I'd been through worse when I was a kid. You see, I spent most of my life as a member of the most maligned, mistreated, and victimized group of people in the world. Yes, I was a middle child. I know it's amazing that I've dealt with it and turned out to be the solid citizen I am today. Trust me when I tell you, it was no thanks to the torture inflicted on me by my brother and sister or the incessant tattling of my younger brother and sister. It's just an inner strength that I somehow was able to develop as I meandered through the obstacle course that was the life of a middle child. Now it wasn't all bad. My big sister Joanne did, on occasion, drive us to the Elks Club to go swimming. After she went to college, we had to walk, and on a hot summer day, there were times I wish I'd worn shoes. My brother Jim was three years older than me and I was his personal crash test dummy. By that I mean that he could torture me all he wanted, but nobody else was allowed. A couple of weeks ago I made this arbor bench for a customer and used a Loctite marine glue to hold it together. I had some left over and figured it would work well on a knife handle because it's strong and water resistant and works on metal and wood. Also, because my wife had used my clear epoxy, and I don't know where she put it. Anyway, back to the story. One day, I made a humorous quip towards a kid named Peter. The other kids thought it was pretty clever, but Peter didn't get the joke. He was a couple of years older than Jim, but he'd only chased me around the yard a couple of times, before Jim stepped in between us and made him stop. Jim was selfish that way. Most kids would have shared a middle kid brother, but not him. On another occasion, and I don't remember how this could have happened, I got to go with Jim to his friend Kyle's house. 
Kyle was one of the characters of life that you never forget. He was half Eddie Haskell and half MacGyver and always in trouble for something. I'll always appreciate Kyle because he's the one who taught me not to try to mount my bike like the Lone Ranger by standing it up under a tree and jumping off a limb onto it. A lot of kids would have benefited from having bracelets that said WWKD. Ask what Kyle would do and then don't. But where's the fun in that? We'd heard that some kids in Racket Club neighborhood had tried to blow up a trash can in a vacant lot. They'd screwed up on the fuse link and the designated lighter had had his hand almost blown off. We'd never heard of Class Envy, but we knew rich kids lived in Racket Club and we had to show them up. That afternoon at Kyle's house, he and Jim got some of his dad's shotgun shell powder and an old pill bottle and made a small bomb. We put it under a trash can and this is where Jim and Kyle were ahead of their years. They took Kyle's dad's good extension cord, cut off the female end, and put the two bare wires about a quarter of an inch apart in the gunpowder. The idea was that when it was plugged in, it would make a spark, ignite the powder, and blow the trash can into the air. We'd be safe the length of the extension cord away. The plan had one shortcoming. We couldn't do it in the vacant lot because it required an electrical source, so we had to set it up in Kyle's backyard. Here it goes. Three two one no boom but his mom came out of the house wondering why the breaker was tripped and the tv went off in the middle of her soaps she said something to kyle about waiting for his father to get off work and jim said we had to go home so i don't know what happened to kyle as for my younger brother and sister i was a model older brother but they both spent their off hours trying to make up new things to tell on me for of course, as a middle child, my mom naturally believed them every time. Sometimes the tattling took a particularly creative form, like the time when I was in high school. Somehow I'd gotten out of the house on a school night and had gone out and drank some beer with my friends. When I got home, I had a fairly full bladder, and it took several emptyings to get back to normal. I didn't want my parents to notice, so I did a couple of them out the second-story bedroom window. The next morning, Diane had to ask in front of my mom why the roof outside my window was wet, but the rest of the roof was dry. That's the kind of kid she was, observant. When I was nine, I was looking in the back of a comic book at the ad. I really wanted sea monkeys, and the only way I could see to get the money was to sell grit. Only in a comic book could you find something you can't live without and a way to finance it on the same page. On the next page was an ad for a magic kit that not only had x-ray specs, which I wouldn't fully appreciate until puberty, but also the ability to levitate your assistant. What? Levitate your assistant? I couldn't pass this up, but even grit wouldn't pay for this one. I decided I just had to figure out how to do it on my own. I'm not sure why, but for my assistant, I chose my big sister, Joanne. At, the, at that time, there were two phones in the house. One was on the kitchen counter, and the other was in my parents' bedroom. When Joanne wanted to talk to her boyfriend, she chose the bedroom phone for privacy reasons. One night, as she and John were deep in conversation, I snuck into the dark room and crawled to the floor on the side of the bed away from the phone. I lay there for several minutes, not eavesdropping on the conversation, and certainly not struggling to hold back a bunch of giggling, at what she was saying. I was waiting for the perfect time to try my levitation experiment. It happened when she somehow heard me breathing. She told John that there was something in the room about to get her and for him to come and save her if she screamed. I heard her inch across the bed towards my hiding place and when she got near the edge of the bed I made a grunting growling noise. The levitation trick worked almost perfectly. The only failure was that when she let go of the ceiling and drifted gently back to the bed, she took her fingernails with her. For years after that, the scars made my forearm look like it had a zipper running down it. They'd almost faded away by the night my first daughter, Lauren, was born. A little side note, um, for the pins, I used a small piece of aluminum tubing that I had in the shop. I'm not sure what I had it for, but it was there. 
it didn't fit quite right. I had to bore out the holes on the knife a little bit, but I was able to do that. Also, uh, in order to make it look better, not to have a hole right through the middle of the blade, and also uh, to strengthen it up, I made a little dowel out of the red eucalyptus, so it made little red dots in the handle. It looks kind of a nice little accent. At some point, I must have dropped the blade because the tip was broken off of it. So I just took it to the grinder and reshaped it before I sharpened it. Well, it looks like all that's left now is a strength test. Remember, Smiths, this isn't about what your blade does to the sweet potato. It's what the sweet potato does to your blade. Oh. We'll also test it with a rotten, to I mean an overripe tomato slice. It will cut. You know, overall, it, it fits really well in the hand. It's very comfortable, feel really good control. I like it. Um, I think if I did it again, I probably wouldn't use that same glue. I'd use just regular epoxy, but I hate to waste stuff, so. And I think this looks fine. Uh, thanks for watching. I really appreciate it, and I hope you enjoyed it. One other thing. The other day, I did a video where I made a fishing lure that looked like a baby goliath grouper if you hadn't seen that one i don't know what rock you're living under i think that went almost as viral as a girl that farts in a jar and sells it on the internet i think there was there was over 40 views so i mean if you didn't see it <laughs> i can't help you but uh in that video i did a format like I did today where instead of saying oh I am sanding I'm doing this I'm doing that I told a story about when I was a kid kind of thought that might be more entertaining than have me tell you what I'm doing and um, I'm asking today if you uh, if you like that format let me know if you don't again in the comments let me know uh, I don't want to do something people don't like I want to do more what people do like and um, if uh, there are no comments at the end of this one I'm going to have to assume that means you want to see me do the next video naked. Boy. So it's really up to you what happens on this channel in the next video. So let me know. Thanks for watching. Y'all take care.